That intro music is so dramatic. I always feel like the sermon's going to be a letdown. You know, like you're going in to see a good movie, and it's like you've been waiting for this thing, and then when you're done, you're like, nah, okay. I hope, yeah, at least the popcorn was good, right, with the extra butter. Good evening. It's good to be with you all. Um, I, uh, I've always enjoyed when I've had the privilege to come over and spend time with uh, my family here at the East Campus, so it's, it's just good to, to be present with you all uh, for uh, at least right now in this particular role for one last time, and uh, I'll save my words of thanks and appreciation to the end of my sermon, uh, if that's okay, because I want to make sure that I preach for at least 40 minutes tonight because, hey, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> We, um, one of the things that I absolutely love about Jesus is that he always tells us the truth. He can be trusted. And as Kevin was reading that gospel reading, I was thinking about what he was telling, um, telling his disciples. I mean, first of all, he is unearthing their expectations, their understanding, their, the way in which that they had been taught to think about how they see themselves as the people of God uh, with the temple and the intersection of heaven and earth. And isn't learning new things hard? It's difficult, even when we know, even when we know. Look, I will tell you, I, I'm one who always likes to say, oh, I love change, bring it on, things have to change, right? But if they change my route to work on any given morning, my day is ruined. Why is this road closed? I have to take a detour. My, you know, so I can sit here and tell you that, yeah, change is a part of life, and we all have to learn to adjust and change. And, you know, to various degrees, we're all comfortable with changing, th- or changing with things that aren't central to us. But sometimes there are things that are even closer to our core that when we sense the Holy Spirit calling us and drawing us, and as Jesus is teaching his disciples about this idea that, look, you guys are looking at this temple, and we have to understand the temple is more than just a building to them. It's everything. Their sense of identity, their sense of space within the world, their understanding of this is where our covenantal God who is faithful to his promises dwells. I mean, this is all there, and Jesus is like, look, I'm just telling you, there's a day coming when none of this is going to be here. And they're like, tell me more about this. And as Jesus tells them, and he goes on, he's like, look, a day's coming when brother will be against brother, when family will be divided against family, that those in the synagogue, if I want to put it this way, those in, the, those in your local faith community, those, those who you've grown up with, they're going to be against you. They're going to flog you. They're going to, you're going to be thrown into prison. But when that happens and you get to stand before officials and, and people in authority, don't worry about what to say because the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say and you are going to be my witnesses. This is one of the ways in which the gospel is going to be proclaimed throughout the world. And I wonder what it was like for these Jesus' followers here. I think it was John, Peter, and Andrew who were there, the Mark's text gives us, how that all would have sounded to them. And I wonder if they internally looked at one another and go, we didn't sign up for this. But I love that Jesus is straight with us from the very beginning. We know, just like Jesus knows, that to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, the arrival of God's kingdom, is going to invite discomfort, tension, and yes, sometimes conflict. And what's really, what's really interesting is even as Jesus encouraged his disciples there, here we find in our Ephesians text, the text that we are traveling to, where is Paul as he is writing this letter? Okay, pop quiz, where's Paul? Really good? Yeah, he's in prison. And the community is distraught about this. 
Paul's like, no, don't let, the, don't let this bother you. My suffering is your glory. The fact that I am in prison right now for this message just proves the fact of what we see in the life and the ministry of Jesus. What is happening now is God's kingdom is breaking in the world and people don't know what to do with it. And he's saying, me being in prison, this is for your glory. This is a testament to the fact that God's power, <coughs> excuse me, is breaking into the world. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture, I just want to spend a few moments looking at a couple of, a couple of really, I mean, this passage, you guys, is so good, but a couple of things just for us to look at because I think it's important. And that is this one, Paul is, Paul sees his task of sharing the gospel as a privilege, as good news, as something he gets to do. How many of you, if I were to say, okay, I want you tonight when you go home to go to someone in your community who you've not talked to about the gospel, and I want you to tell them the gospel story. How many of you would be like, yes, sign me up, let's go. How many of you go, I would love to, but that makes me nervous. Yeah, but it's like anything else. This is what I want to, this is what I want to encourage with you, encourage uh, with you. Like we are, we are called to share this good news with others, are we not? With our lives, with how we live. And sometimes, thankfully, sometimes we have to, and sometimes we don't always have to use our words. Sometimes we do have to. And I will tell you as somebody who is, who has, um, grown in this area over, you know, 30, 30 plus years of following or, or, or responding to the fact that Jesus has called me to himself and wanting to follow him, that I haven't always gotten this right. But I want to give you a couple of just, just ideas for encouragement to prayerfully think about. So let's look at it this way. How many of you have ever had an argument with someone you love? I only see like three people. Okay, okay, good. So everyone's like thinking, didn't we have absolution already, Pastor Jonathan? I don't have to raise my hand here. How many of you have, in that argument, have practiced what you are going to say as you get ready to talk to that person? How many of you know someone so well that you're like, I'm going to say this, and then they're going to say this, and if they say this, I'll counter with this, checkmate, I win the argument. Has anyone ever done that? <laughs> we, thank you. Doug, I love you. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> and if you're watching this on the live stream uh, or on the, on the recorded sermon tomorrow, um, I won't tell you Doug's last name, so I won't incriminate him forever. But we do that. We practice. And I want to encourage you with this. Begin to practice how you would share the gospel story with others. How you would share your own faith, your faith journey in your own words. Because here's the reality. Practice makes what? Can I encourage you with something? If we think that's the case, we're never going to share it. Because one of the things that hinders us from sharing, I believe, is we don't want to say the wrong thing. Practice doesn't make perfect, but what practice can make is permanent. It can encourage us to, with joy, like Paul, share this gospel message with others. So Paul, even though he's, he's in prison, sees this calling to share the gospel message with the Gentiles as a gift. And he's encouraging them in their new life that they, as we have traveled through the book of Ephesians, that they now, as Gentiles, are fully vested, included members into the kingdom of God. That the Gentiles who for millennia had been viewed by faithful, Torah-abiding individuals of Abraham's family now had all the rights and privileges. And there's tension that comes with that. For them, for the community, the Jewish community of Jesus followers, 
But if you read the book of Ephesians, if you read all of Paul's letters, if you read the Gospels, even if you read the Old Testament, there is this, there is this whisper, and it's not really a whisper, it's this loud prophetic voice that God all along has in mind the redemption, the renewal of all nations, that he is making for himself one new people, both Jew and Gentile. This was always the plan. And how we know it's always the plan is even as we look at the story that we often refer to are in the older, uh, the Old Testament, the, the story of God's people before the arrival of Jesus, what we see all the time is some of the most faithful people are Gentiles. They are the ones who respond in faith. And Paul is reminding them again of their identity, but this is what he says now. Where he says this, God's purpose, this this open secret now that God was revealing in and through the Messiah, Jesus, that through Jesus, there was now one new people. Everyone say one. one. That it was God's purpose in all of this, that the church, and if you are a part of the church, raise your hand, that the church was called to display the wisdom of God in all of its rich variety to the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places, according to his eternal plan, which he carried out through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so our calling today, even in 2021, as we are about to transition into a new year, is still anchored into this story that the church is called to express the manifold wisdom, the the rich variety of God's wisdom within the world. And so I want to spend just a couple of seconds talking about what wisdom is and why it's important. We do we not live in a world in need of wisdom? How many of us, even as we try to navigate our own spiritual formation in our own lives as disciples, have ever stopped and in our prayers or in our meditations or in our thoughts, have gone, I, wonder what I, I wonder what the right thing to do is here. And of course, I, when I think of wisdom, I think of, my mind automatically goes to King Solomon. The one who, can you, I mean, We're going to ask our, like, let me ask you this. Tonight, if Jesus tangibly showed up in your home and said, hey, what do you want? Anything, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. What would you ask for? Be honest. You don't, I don't want to know your answer, but I want you to think about what would you ask for? Solomon asks for this thing called wisdom. He understood the task in front of him was way beyond anything that he could do on his own and isn't the church's task, when we think about it on our own, in our own power, way too beyond us to do anything apart from the Holy Spirit moving in and through us? But it's wisdom. It's this idea that God gives within us a perspective, an understanding of his world, of his kingdom. And it means for many of us that sometimes, right, with wisdom, one size doesn't fit what doesn't fit all. Wisdom might call us to do one thing in one situation and do something a little bit different in another. We see this lived out. I mean, this is why uh, James, the brother of Jesus, would say this, if any of you lacks what? Let him ask God who will give liberally without finding fault. And where we actually see and draw from and understand the wisdom of God fully expressed is in through the life and death of Jesus. The wisdom of God is made known and expressed in his willingness to allow his son to come into the world, to put on flesh, to show us what it means to be human. 
what it means to live life from a perspective of this inbreaking kingdom of God, this rule and reign in which God is going to be faithful to his promises that he is slowly but sh- surely undoing the impact of the fall. And that part of that then is to give to his image bearers, which is who we are, wisdom. This profound sense of discernment and grace and truth and love in which we live in the world for the betterment of others in order to rightly represent Jesus within our world. And this is what you and I are called to. We are called to embody this wisdom. The church as a community, we are meant to embody this wisdom. I love the church. And there are many moments when my heart breaks for sometimes the condition we find ourselves in. Because all too often, We as a people are not relying on the wisdom of the Spirit. We are simply fighting the world's battles, the world's way. But all we're doing is using Christian language to do it. The way of the cross is different. The way of the cross means we live by dying, we win by losing. We steward our power and influence for the benefit of others. We lean into the discomfort of the world that we live in. It means that we actually learn to see and know and love and treat people as if they're better than ourselves, even the person who you know you're better than. The way of the cross is difficult but we are called to have a prophetic voice, to stand out, to be a signpost that shows people that that the church just isn't one in many options or the church, and that the church hasn't been co-opted by voices on the left or voices on the right, but that the church as a whole is distinctly different because we have a king, we have a sovereign, we have a kingdom that's been given to us And this is where identity first and foremost comes from. And as we live in that reality and express the wisdom of God and and share that with others, we speak to the principalities and powers and rulers of the air that we live in that seek to oppress, that seek to marginalize, that seek to to dehumanize people. All too often, we end up fighting people, but there's a larger battle behind that that God is inviting us to speak to with the kingdom of God. And so I'll say this. I want to say this. I, oh, my gosh. This goes so fast. Um, I am speaking for 40 minutes tonight. <laughs> and there was no Nebraska game today, so everyone should have plenty of energy. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, Here's what the prophetic voice does. It speaks to the truth of God in the world that lets people know what he has accomplished in and through Jesus. It serves as a signpost, as a way for people to look and go, there is a different way to be in community, a different way to be human, a different way to live. And it serves as a model to the world. The church is meant to be a model to the world, that there is something unique and different about who we are as people, both Jew and Gentile, together. This is why Paul goes to great lengths in the book of Ephesians to say that one of the signposts, one of the realities of what Jesus has done is to make from two people who were continually at odds with one another one. This is the signpost. Do we live in a world still that's divided? We're tribal. We have in our minds ideas of who is in and who is out. 
whether it's conscious or subconscious. And sometimes those things are so formed without us, are so formed within us throughout our lives that we don't even realize it until the Spirit gives us an epiphany that we were making distinctions, that we were creating divisions. But then, just like now, one of the beautiful gifts of the church is that we're to be a place of belonging, of hospitality. The vision that John sees in the book of Revelation is every nation, tribe, and tongue before the throne of God. This is the gift of Pentecost. As God delivers the good news of the gospel in all the various languages of people who had come to Jerusalem to worship. And as we live this out, there will be tension. There will be conflict. People will, be mis- people will misunderstand. We teach our children all the time to do the right thing, do we not? We tell them, you can never go wrong by doing the right thing. But how many of you have ever done the right thing and it's gone horribly wrong? And it happens within the church. I've experienced it firsthand. It happens. But we're called to be a signpost. We're called to reflect that there's a greater reality among us that we are invited to and that we trust that even when there is temporary suffering, temporary setback, persecution, that it won't have the last word. Seek the kingdom first. Seek the kingdom first. And I can promise you this, as you seek the kingdom, and it would just start by this, as you pray. Like, I get it. We pray that every time we say the Lord's Prayer, but I'm not sure what that looks like. I'm not sure what that means. This is the encouragement that I gave to, um, to our family over at West last week. Just pray, Jesus, show me your kingdom. I'm not sure what it looks like, but show it to me. And we'll see transformation on three different levels, personal, within our faith community, and then within our, within our neighborhoods. You'll start seeing the kingdom everywhere. It's kind of like when you buy a car and you think your car is unique, and then the minute you start driving it, what do you do? You see everyone else in the city who has the same exact car that you do. And this is like, this is what it means. This this will happen when you see the kingdom. So I want to share one quick story. Before uh, I grew up in church, I grew up in church. Um... And I always believed. I always, I always had a belief. Let me, let me rephrase that. I always had a belief. But like for a lot of, for a lot of people, my, it was kind of just privatized. I'll get to it when I get to it. But when I was in my early 20s, my, my life had kind of hit a rock bottom. And I remember thinking to myself, if I can live faithfully for one year, I know I can live faithfully forever, well, for the rest of my life. But my spiritual journey had felt a lot like a roller coaster. But I remember, I remember praying that. And I'm not worried if the prayer was theologically correct or not. It was just coming from a sincere heart that said, I, if I, I know, I know. I know that if I can live close to Jesus for just one year, because I've never been able to do it for more than one week. So that's kind of a high standard. If I can do it for a year. And I can remember during that year, my brother and I, my brother and I were uh, working at uh, Sears, and we worked in the sporting goods, the sporting goods department, and one day we had to take, um, do you remember the old paint department? They had the old paint mixers? We had to take a paint mixer from our store to a store that was about 45 minutes away. And my brother and I loaded it up in the truck with two other workers, and we were going. And my brother was, he was younger than me, but for a lot of my growing up, he was my spiritual hero because he always seemed to be walking with Jesus. 
So in some ways, I looked up to him because he seemed to be much more faithful on staying the course than I was at that point. And he, had, he knew because I told him that I'd made this commitment to say, if I could just make it a year, I know I could serve him. So we're driving to this other store, and we get there, and we start unloading the, we start unloading the, the paint mixer. And as we get it down off the truck, I'm, I'm holding it, and I'm laying it down like this, and my head goes between the, the mixer and a shelf that was up here. And I forgot the shelf was up here. And so we set it down, and I stood up real fast. But as I stood up, I smacked my head right on the back of the shelf. And it hurt. And old Mario would have said things that I can't say here right now. But I remember looking at my brother, and tears began to well in my eyes from the pain. And I said one word. I said, ouch. And my brother looked at me, put his hand on his hip like this, laughed, and he goes, well, I guess you really have changed. (laughs) The kingdom transforms us. It changes us. Small change, little change, all of a sudden takes root, and it grows into something more. It changes how we live as communities of faith. And I was thinking of two examples that I want to share with you. This is what it means to image the kingdom within the world, to do it differently. Do you remember last summer we had, or this summer we had that storm that knocked out power? There was a, there was a, there's a faith community that, that we are, that, that we have a, a friendship with that is in the Benson area. And their pastor got on Facebook Live and he said this, church, we're not having service tomorrow. But we are having church. Bring your gloves. Bring your garbage bags. Bring your power tools. We're cleaning up our neighborhood. We'll have coffee, water, and donuts for everyone to get here. I guess that's like the standard. Like coffee, water, and donuts, people will come. And their community showed up. And they showed out. They spent the morning as a community of faith going into the neighborhood, cleaning trees, cleaning yards. Four people in their neighborhood. A signpost. A prophetic voice. Another church, and I can't remember where this was at. I think it was like three Easter's ago. Every Easter they would do something. They would give a gift for people who would come to services. But one year what they did is they had everyone in their community bring in their, uh, bring in their medical debt. And the church paid off all their community's medical expenses. Signpost of new creation. That there's a different way of doing things. Sometimes debt is our problem. Sometimes things happen that are beyond our control. But do you see how sometimes our attitudes, like you got into that mess, you have to get yourself out. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't do that? Can you imagine if the God of the universe treated us like sometimes how we might respond to others? And it's just muscle memory. It's just reflex. We don't even think about it. But this is what the kingdom does. It opens up a way for other people to see this community is radically different. And I know probably some of us now are thinking, wait a minute, a church paying off? And it was like millions of dollars worth of medical debt. But the church counted the cost. And they felt this was what they were supposed to do in their community. Was it expensive? Yes. Did it cost them? Sure. But I can't think of a more beautiful action that resembles what Jesus did on the cross. Costly. Lavish. Undeserving. And people in a community will look at a church like that and go, there's something different about those people. Two simple, easy ways to express the lavish wisdom of God in the world. Okay. I was only half joking about preaching 40 minutes. I'm going to end up with this. We are about to enter into the Advent Christmas season. 
It's a season where we mark the waiting, the hope, and the anticipation of God's rescue plan. LCM as a community, I pray that we would continue to follow the way of Jesus. We are meant to continue to do his work. If Jesus can take five loaves and two fish and give thanks and take care of thousands of people, the endless possibilities for us as people who have been entrusted by Jesus to continue in his work, empowered and indwelling with the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, there's nothing we can't do when we follow him, even if it's costly, even if it causes conflict even if it looks like different than anything else anyone around us is doing. This is what it means to embody the vision of uh, the kingdom of God, to express the wisdom of God. We're called to grow in our capacity. Oh, let me restate. Let me, let, me, let me restate this. If I can give you one last word of encouragement, as you all consider what the immediate future and the long-term future of LCM will be as a community of faith. I would encourage you with this. Grow in your capacity of becoming comfortable with discomfort. That you would lean into the places that long for new creation the most. Ron Dotzler, who is the founder of Abide Omaha, said it this way, that as we move into the brokenness of our world, that brokenness will transform us. And he's right. When we lean into the places that need it most, we become a signpost. We reflect the image of God. We, re we reflect Jesus to our world. And we assure people that our present situation will not have the last word. That resurrection and new creation is well on the way. It has truly been a joy for me to serve Jesus with you all for the last three and a half years. I wanna thank you for your presence and your perspective and the way in which you have helped me grow as a disciple of Jesus. And I pray that my presence here has encouraged you in some ways as well. My location is changing, but my vocation is not. You and I, we're still in this together. And this is what we're called to be. And so together, let's continue to follow Jesus in the way of the cross, trusting that as we show this wisdom to the world, people will respond and find this gift of eternal life in a new place to be, and they join this large cloud of witnesses retelling this gospel story time and again. And all of God's people said, amen. Perfect. Look at that timer. <laughs> Perfect. Someone said a timer. Whoever set me a timer, God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> With that, I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to continue in our service using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.